Good afternoon. My name is Ben Hovland and I'm chairman of the Election Assistance Commission. Today's video chat is taking place at a unique time in our nation's history. For election administrators, the novel coronavirus and COVID-19 have created an environment that demands tough choices regarding the safety of voters, election workers, and their staff. The EAC is working to provide information and resources for election officials by coordinating with state, local, and federal partners and offering whatever support we can at the federal level to help state and local officials administer safe, secure, accessible, and accurate elections. As part of that, we've organized this video as the third in a series discussing how election officials can best prepare for an increased usage of vote by mail ballots in 2020. Today's video builds on recommendations we heard about in the earlier videos, specifically when preparing for an increase in vote by mail or vote at home, communicating with voters about changes to the process is integral to success. We are fortunate to be joined by three experts with, an extensive, with extensive experience improving communications with voters on these issues. <clears throat> Brian Corley has been serving the citizens of Pasco County, Florida as their supervisor of elections since 2007. And in that time, he has presided over 30 elections with more than 1.5 million votes cast. During his tenure, the Pasco County Elections Office continues to be recognized for innovation, efficiency, and transparency. Mr. Corley is a state certified election administrator by the Florida Department of State and is the past president of the Florida State Association of Supervisors of Elections. Uh, Amber McReynolds is the CEO for the National Vote at Home Institute and Coalition and is the former director of elections for Denver, Colorado. During her time there, she transformed the elections division into a national and international award-winning office. She has proven that designing pro-voter policies, voter-centric processes, and implementing technical innovations will improve the representation for all voters. And Whitney Quisenberry is the director of the Center for Civic Design, the home of the field guides to ensuring voter intent. The Center for Civic Design's work on best practices for election design from work on vote by mail envelopes to plain language and voter outreach supports election offices and makes it easier for everyone to vote. Thank you all for joining me today. And let's just jump right into the questions. As jurisdictions across the country prepare for an increase in vote by mail or a vote at home experience, we've heard about the need for expanded communication and voter education efforts. What are some of the initial items local election officials should consider when determining how best to communicate with their voters on these issues? Brian, could you kick us off? Sure, I'd love to. Ben, let me just say thanks for having me and I'm honored to be on such an esteemed panel. Um, obviously, this is a very trying time for our nation um, and certainly as elections administrators, but I, I'm certain we're gonna rise to the challenge. We know this, we have to have elections or the underpinnings of our democracy and failure is certainly not an option. We'll, we'll, we'll get through this. With regards to your question, I think the key word here is initial uh, because it, it's an ongoing process. It's not as simple as just saying, here are the criteria initial and then followed up by repetitive uh, voter education efforts. You know, when you think about the various states and, um, and jurisdictions, deadlines are very, very important uh, with regards to when you can request, uh, for example, vote by mail or vote at home uh, ballot. How, how to vote by mail. You know, I, I know some jurisdictions really only focus on May Election Day and others, you know, like Florida has Election Day, early voting, uh, and of course, vote at home or vote by mail. So voters who may not be familiar with that concept need to, quite frankly, be educated. I think we, we take it for granted, those of us in the business of how easy it is, but it can be a little intimidating for those that maybe have never done it before. Um, you know, and how to, how to track um, your, your ballot to the system. Uh, I'm going to keep plugging this and thanks to Amber for the, for the lead on this, but uh, we had used Ballot Scout uh, very successfully. And that ties into the two most important words ever, voter confidence. Um, you know, a lot of voters are leery at first, you know, hey, I'm used to going to the polling place and I know my vote counts because I see it go on the machine. How do I know my vote counts and how do I know you get it back? And being able to track your, your ballot, like an Amazon package, for lack of a better term, and know that when we got it back, and if there's a problem, we're gonna let you know if there's an issue with your signature that requires a curing like we have here in Florida, uh, we're gonna be able to do that. And lastly, let me just say the importance of partnerships and best practices as it relates to voter education. I know um, I was made aware of one of my colleagues 
how you can utilize um, the county administration for a particular county has text alerts set up for uh, public safety. Harnessing that to be able to reach out to voters to, you know, on a mass level about the availability and whatnot, uh, and also just for best practices. So all that combined, again, it's, it's only initial, it's only a starting point. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Amber, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, the only other thing I would add is, um, in addition to the um, communication about options to vote, also communicating uh, how voters can update their addresses and the voter registration aspect of things, because that's sort of the first step in making sure that voters can get a ballot mailed to them is making sure their address is up to date. So um, when we when we transitioned Colorado's system, one of the sort of priorities that we uh, built into our marketing um, efforts was this sort of first phase of encouraging voter registration, encouraging voters to update their addresses ahead of ballots being mailed, and then as Brian mentioned, signing up for the ballot tracking tool. So those were all key elements of that. And then and then also, and I'm sure Whitney's going to weigh in on this, but the ballot packet itself is a key uh, communicator, if you will, to voters. And so with ballots going out and mail ballots going out, it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to make sure voters are clear on what the instructions are. Thank you. That's a great point on the need to update uh, folks' address. And certainly right now, while uh, a lot of people are sitting at home, uh, it's a great opportunity if your state has online registration to go ahead and, and take care of that and make sure that your registration information is, is up to date. Um, Whitney, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I want to just pull this up a level because all the details are obviously things that we need to communicate. But um, when we did research on voter guides for, uh, for uh, the kind of voter guides that get mailed out to, to voters across the state, one of the things that we found is that they have the biggest challenge is not their understanding who's on their ballot, but, the, but just the civics literacy gap. So understanding the mechanics of voting. I think when we change an election system, we're, we often spend a lot of time saying, well, here's how it used to be and here how, here's how it is now. When what voters want to know is what do I do this election? Um, and so focusing on how it will be, um, reassuring, being reassuring that there's a process in place, there's going to be good integrity for that election by just demonstrating that it's easy to explain and clear, simple, plain language. And the last thing is making sure that we connect the actions they have to take to, the, to what they're doing. So not just uh, mail your ballot back, but how do you mail your ballot back? What action should you take and when should you take it? So that it's all very concrete um, and people know the steps they need to take. And then they can fill in the details about exactly where that drop box is or exactly when they can expect their ballot envelope to arrive. But some of those things that we take for granted that, that all this stuff is gonna happen in a sequence of actions just is, is a little bit of a black box to voters. And so demystifying the process. Those are great tips. So a bit of a step-by-step -step guide in, in instructions to voters. Mm -hmm. So as, a, as experts on communicating with voters about election mail, what are some of the significant lessons learned that you've seen that may help election officials across the country? Uh, Amber, do you want to start off? Sure. Um, I, I think uh, first and foremost, um, the earlier, the better. <laughs> So, you know, I think as, as we've been seeing with the pandemic and the crisis and sort of the issues that election officials are facing across the country, um, setting up a, a, um, a communication stream where uh, voters can trust the information they're getting from the election offices and have a go-to resource on that is really important. And I think beyond just direct communication with voters, it's also important for election officials to be bring in their stakeholder group. So uh, one of the things that we did in Denver is we set up an advisory committee that included a lot of the groups that were focused on voting um, rights and outreach to voters, the business community, um, all, all the stakeholders that we essentially um, sort of pull in, we, we did and we uh, regularly shared updates with them. We went to them as we had information to share with the public and so creating that um, uh, sort of champions, if you will, for your office that touch all sorts of different dimensions of the community are, are really important and it, and, it, and it can leverage a lot more power than just you sort of doing it on your own. So, you know, by building a coalition like that, building a supportive network, they can help amplify the message that the election officials are trying to put out. Um, and I think it's really important to do something like that 
now uh, so that so that voters and and all of those stakeholders can start engaging in, in what not only the upcoming primaries are going to look like, but also what the November election might bring. That's a great idea. Uh, Whitney, do you want to add to that? I just want to build on this idea that that communications is a process, not an event, right? It, it goes on across the way. Like typically, we would have a year or so to introduce a new change like this. Um, but even if you have a, you know, whether you have a short period of time or a long period of time, making sure that you're reaching people in different media um, with, with focusing on different aspects of the process at the right time so that you're telling people what they need to do now in the process and that you're keeping it as simple as possible. I think for me, one of the challenges uh, working on election information is that elections seem easy, but they're actually really complicated. There's a lot of uh, slight variations or things that happen depending on, you know, the date or depending on who you are or how you're registered and trying to find ways to keep that as simple as possible so that your first answer is the general one. And then you can go if, you know, if you're overseas, if you have a disability, if you're, you know, voting in a different way. Um, but keeping, keeping the, the message as clear as possible and also using visual tools. Uh, far too many pieces of, of voter information are kind of a, a wall of FAQs. Um, but show people pictures of what it looks like. Uh, so show people look, look close up of where they should sign on their envelope. Uh, and of course, you're using that X in the middle, in the, in the square, so that people can find the right place to sign and help them find that, not just find it somewhere in the envelope, but exactly where it is, so that we can be as specific as possible. I'll take that as constructive criticism for my PowerPoint, uh, that is all words. But <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Brian, uh, you want to chime in here? Sure, it's tough to top on, uh, add on to that, but a couple things. Amber said it best earlier in the process, the better. Knowing that voters need to know that the elections office is the trusted communication source. You know, a lot of times they're bombarded with information from campaigns or political parties and it may not always be, or third party groups, may not always, always be accurate, but knowing that if they have a question, they can reach out to their elections office. Um, and lessons learned, probably should have reached out to uh, Whitney earlier because I know from my own uh, mistakes, you know, for example, in Florida, the the model is on the outside of the envelope is where voters sign and now they put their home phone number, their cell number and their, their email. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be your mother's maiden name or last four of your social, I imagine, if Florida lets they trust their way. But that's there visible for all to see. We tried a flap, didn't work real well. So uh, I did actually borrow from my colleague, David Stafford, who I believe uh, consulted with uh, Whitney on this. And uh, Thank you, Whitney, because it was a, a huge success that we borrowed uh, David's model. But um, keeping it simple, the language on the envelopes is very, very important. Um, you know, it, with lessons learned is, is buy-in. I think Amber alluded to this as well. Voters need to know that the urban legend is simply not true. Uh, you know, every week I speak to the jury pool, several hundred people, and invariably I, the question gets asked of me, well, I heard that vote by mail ballots only count in, in close elections or recounts. And uh, to this day, that's an urban legend. So we need to dispel through communication and, and to, to relay that's simply not true. And so voters know when they cast their vote from home, it's secure, it's, it's efficient, and it's going to count. Um, those, those three things, are, I think, are pretty important. That's great. And actually, just as a quick follow-up, Brian, you had mentioned about Scout earlier. Have you found or have you heard from voters that that helped with their confidence and believing that their ballot had been received and counted? Yeah, there are no words to, to, uh, to relay how grateful I am to, for Amber for kind of leading me on to that because um, we were the, luckily, thanks, thanks to Amber, we were the first jurisdiction in Florida to utilize it. And uh, resoundingly, the voters absolutely love it. it. It's a nice security blanket knowing, especially uh, being able to opt in for a text or an email alert knowing when the ballot gets back to the elections office. Uh, I, I, if I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times, how, what a great tool it was. Uh, and again, I think it helps to reinforce that, that voter confidence. So it was a huge, huge win for us. Great. That's a sneak preview probably to the resources section we'll get to uh, in a minute. But before then, can you all discuss any specific examples of communication efforts that you've worked on or seen that would improve the voter experience or help voters have more confidence in the mail ballot process. Uh, Brian, you want to kick us off? Sure, I'd love to. Um, a couple things. We are, we're required to send uh, in Florida every uh, voter, when you register, 
uh, really any activity. If you change your party, your address, what's called a voter information card. Obviously, it's not an ID card. It's strictly informational. It lists your, your political party, where your polling place is. But it gives us an opportunity to do a little outreach and education. So we heavily promoted the vote by mail concept or vote at home concept. And that's where we saw an uptick in our request in between elections. So that was very helpful. On our sample ballots, you know, we sent a, um, a sample ballot to every voter except those that have a request to vote by mail or vote at home. It's a great opportunity to plug those who are going to utilize early voting or election day. You know, we kind of, especially for busy elections, we sort of politely say avoid the lines, uh, vote from home, and, and we, it gives us a chance to promote that as well. We work with our community partners, our, our chamber of commerce, our businesses. Um, I know our, our, for example, our, our elected sheriff has an amazing social media program where he is, his uh, media, social media presence is, is phenomenal. And he's going to be working with us to, to promote on his Twitter feed and Facebook and Instagram the concept of voting from home. So using all those, you know, all those tools available to you, there's the only, it's sort of like this, the only, the only uh, dumb question is the one that I asked. Ask those questions. How can I better uh, reach those individuals to, to help facilitate the voting process and vote by mail process? That's great. Thank you. Uh, Whitney, do you want to talk about any specific experiences that you had or examples you've seen? I think that the, uh, an example I've seen that I want to make sure I, we bring out is that uh, when election officials do uh, either a, a diagram tool or a video tour, or I mean, I guess in, when we get past all this, uh, all past COVID, being able to open up your offices and show how uh, the vote by mail processing happens in the back office. I, I love those videos personally. I think they're, they're, they humanize the office. They, they, they show that you have a process in place. They're not just dumping a big pile of mail in the middle of the floor and everybody's ripping open the envelopes. Um, and I think it makes people feel like they understand what's happening in something that's new. Uh, I've heard uh, Ricky Hatch, I've heard Amber talk about it. I've heard Jennifer Morrell from when she was from Arapaho talk about it. But I, uh, just that sense that this is your election office and we'll, we'll show you how you, we work. I think it really does a lot to improve confidence. Absolutely. Uh, Amber? Yeah, well, I, again, uh, it's an entire system and it's, um, you know, the communication aspect of, of the work of election officials is, is a key uh, element of increasing voter confidence and improving the, the voter experience overall. So a couple of examples, as, as Whitney mentioned, we, um, the videos, and we were very aggressive about that, sharing the uh, videos, whether it be live while ballot processing was going on or ahead of the election to kind of walk voters through the process, but also then following that with, uh, we have a, Denver had a, what was called an election cycle um, on the website and it would list out every step in the process with an explanation of what happens. Um, so that kind of complements those videos, uh, opening the office for watchers and observers. So. I know many of you have visited Denver and, and, you know, we had the kind of windows where anyone from the public could observe. It wasn't like it was only people with credentials. You, anyone could come and see that. So I think all of those things are really important in terms of confidence. And then, as Brian mentioned, the ballot tracking tool. And believe it or not, Denver rolled out their first um, ballot trace tool back in 2009. So it's 11 years old now uh, in use in Denver, which is pretty incredible. Um, and now we're seeing it in use around the country. But that tool, that in and of itself provides that communication to voters, but it also is, it serves as a reminder to them as well. So if they haven't turned their ballot in yet, for instance, you can text them or email them and say, hey, the election's a few days away, click here to find your nearest drop-off location. And you can, and then you continue to build confidence because not only is it a to, you know, let voters know and give them the confidence that it's been received, but it also gives them the confidence throughout the process. Um, a couple other things that I've seen and that we that we did as part of our um, marketing efforts in Denver is leveraging the things that are already happening in your jurisdiction. So, one of the years we had we had a, a note added to all the utility bills that Denver Water and some of the other uh, entities in the city were using. And so, there's so many different. Uh, mailers and, and bills and billing things and everything that goes out from various entities. And so even just an ask to get them to add, you know, whether it's the voter registrar's website or information about registering a vote or any of that kind of thing can be added into existing mail pieces that doesn't actually cost anything extra. Um, so I've been suggesting that a lot. And I think that's 
really important, especially in this crisis that we're dealing with where we're within six months of the election, leveraging everything the government has is really important to make sure that the message gets out. And that's not just at the local level, that's also at the state level. A ton of mailings happening um, all the time from all government agencies. And so leveraging those, even just to put either an insert or a, uh, a note on the actual utility bills themselves is really important. And what we found is um, the business community especially was very enthusiastic about doing that. We shared reg regular content across neighborhood organizations. Um, apartment buildings would put out information that we would email them. So I, I just encourage people to think big, uh, think about how you can reach every single person that you need to reach. And there's multiple ways to do that without actually adding to your expenses. So they're great ideas. And actually, Amber, I know I've heard you say before, you know, go to where the voters are. I, I just read an article today, but I believe it was about uh, Hamilton County, Ohio, uh, putting uh, absentee request forms at the grocery store for people that didn't have printers uh, and so weren't able to necessarily print those off. So again, I think to the point, uh, looking at uh, what resources you have, what opportunities do you have to get to where people are, uh, and so really appreciate that. And you can put you can put a ballot box in a mobile vote center at a grocery store too. Just saying. <laughs> Great point. Um, so I mean, again, thinking about sort of all these resources, um, you know, Whitney, I'll let you kick this one off. But are there particular resources that you would point to that can help jurisdictions communicate with their voters who may not be accustomed to mail ballots or the process and procedures associated with obtaining a mail ballot? Well, through Prometheus a Pitch, we've been gathering design artifacts, um, all the materials, the flyers and the envelopes and things like that on our website. We have a little toolkit that's linked there. Um, there are so much that goes into a vote by mail election, and some of that is, you know, ballot sorters and openers, and those are well beyond us. But we are focusing on sort of our wheelhouse, which is uh, designing the information well. Uh, so we have a set of envelope templates. We're uh, working with, we work with the U.S. Postal Service. They're in use in about five states right now. Um, Michigan adopted them this year and really had no problems with them. Uh, and in fact, the good design helped reduce the number of envelopes that came in without a signature compared to their previous election, even with lots of new vote by mail voters. But we've gone beyond that. We're working on a pocket guide that's uh, basic information to help explain vote by mail to people who've never experienced it before. We have a, a whole toolkit of a um, whole library of civic icons and images that you can use in your materials. So it's sort of pre-done in a bunch of formats. Uh, the point of all of these samples is that they're, uh, they're, not, they're, they're not really templates in that you, you don't have to use them exactly as they are. In fact, they're meant to be customized. So we know that every election official, well, first of all, you've got to put your own county name on it, uh, your own address, your own email address, um, your own election dates. But it means that you have um, materials that you can use to adjust to the features of your vote by mail election, the exact rules, how it's working. Um, uh, we particularly love the pocket guide because it is an eight page, uh, an eight page little brochure, but it's printed on a single piece of eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So it can come off of pretty much any printer. Uh, and one of the things that we found is that some of the groups, uh, the outside groups really love them. So the campus voter guides like them, uh, the campus get out the vote folks like them because they were very small. They could hand them out on campus easily. They could put their campus colors on it and things like that to make it a little more personalized. Um, but it means that instead of their spending their effort trying to recreate the, the, the basic information, you're starting them from accurate, clear information uh, and then letting them build on it to, to make it look uh, personalized to their community. And you can do the same thing for your community if you're an election office. Uh, so we're adding, adding to that all, all the time. We just got a request from uh, someone who said they're going to be mailing out absentee ballot request forms or mailing ballot request forms. And could we help them design an envelope that would look kind of official um, and encourage people to open it? So we're doing that and working. And as we, as we do all these things, we're posting them uh, just as, as it comes along. So if someone has a, they're stuck on a problem trying to figure out how to write something or how to lay out an envelope, um, we're there for you. And we'll then share what we do with you back to everyone else. That's great. And certainly we're happy to, uh, we'll try to post whatever we can or that you want to share with us below this video on our website, on the EAC website. But, um, you know, so certainly welcome that and want to try to uh, get people to the right spot. 
Uh, Amber, do you have other resources you'd point to? Um, yeah, I would, uh, I think the Center for Civic Design is just incredible with all the resources they're putting out. Uh, and then we did coordinate a webinar series with CCD as well as CTCL. Um, and that's on our website. Um, we've also been collecting kind of good examples of communication efforts that different jurisdictions are making. Orange County, California has done an amazing job with some of the things they've put out. Brian's done an, an amazing job in, in Pasco. Um, and we've been trying to collect some of these examples um, that are on the National Vote at Home Institute's website, but also um, happy to share with, with you, Ben, as well, to, to put on the EAC site. Um, so there's some there's some really great creativity. Um, and I even, I think, uh, election officials remembering to follow their fellow election colleagues on Twitter. There's some interesting things that a lot of election offices are putting out now. Um, Madison has had an abundance of information daily about their process right now, which is which has been interesting. Um, and I would also say that, you know, leverage kind of other people's networks as well. So similar to the elections advisory group that, that I had mentioned, um, building content in your election office that then you can give to others to share is really important. Um, we did uh, just an example of something we did. We um, there was a Spanish language radio station that has a huge following in Denver and we just asked them to post a few things on their Twitter account and that produced some of our highest volume um, touch points and, and everything because they have such a massive following and we customize some things to give them. Uh, so, so leveraging sort of others to help with your message and getting that out there also is, is really important to try to reach a wide audience. Um, and then I think just simple, sim simply messaging, like simple messaging, because really with, with a, a vote by mail type of process, the key is voter registration and address being updated sort of as step number one. Step number two is the ballot's going to come to you. So making sure the instructions are clear, you understand them, and, and they have everything that you need as a voter, um, uh, including even things on the outside of the envelope because a lot of people will throw their instructions away before they go to drop off their ballot. So we always made sure our website, for instance, was on the outside of the envelope if, if voters needed to, to find us. Um, but that it's sort of a you know three-step process. It's your voter registration is coming, you get your ballot and you need to vote your ballot and you need to return it. So it's pretty clear, um, more clear actually than the sort of normal way that we go about doing elections with having to know where to go and find your polling place, which might change election to election and all of those things. So there, there, it, it's sort of, I think approaching it in a really clear way uh, is really important. That's great, thank you. Brian? Yeah, I, I would to piggyback off of that. I would say be creative. Um, you know, you want to, I heard, go where the voters are. Um, one of my favorite stories about that is one of my colleagues uh, partnered with the McDonald's in their jurisdiction and every, Mac, you know, the on the trays it has a little paper covering and it had information about their office to include vote by mail. So, you know, one thing we all have in common as Americans that 99% of us go to McDonald's, some of us more than others, hypothetically just saying. Um, but being creative and keeping it simple. I know um, I've done PSAs where I've just asked my, my local cable provider, can you run this PSA as a courtesy? And they did a lot. And that's free advertising. And it's, of course, you know, selling democracy. Uh, and, you know, having a social media presence, utilizing those platforms. Um, even uh, your county probably has a television network. Um, I know, and, and they did that for, for me as well. We, uh, I filmed some of the other PSAs and our libraries uh, were, were gracious enough to allow it to be in the lobby and played on a loop. That way voters were coming in um, as coming and going, were able to see, be inundated with that information. Uh, partnering with, in our case, uh, our county tax collector is where individuals go to renew their driver's license. And um, Amber alluded to this inserts. We were able to get with that individual and, and uh, he provided uh, the availability for us to put inserts in there. You're talking 40,000 people a month. Those are 40,000 citizens. Now, they're not necessarily registered to vote, but it's a great thing to get them registered and, of course, vote by mail. Uh, same with our utility bills. You're, you're, you're canvassing nearly your entire population to, to get them the opportunity to register to vote and certainly vote by mail. Um, you know, and some, something Whitney said, it doesn't have to be a fancy 
video. I know some of my most successful ones have been where I've picked up my iPhone and just done an impromptu, you know, up to quick update to uh, the voters. And, 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 you know, I've done one during early voting when there was a line out the door for, you know, a, a 20 minute wait. And, and I had, it was a perfect, had it in the backdrop as I'm speaking with my iPhone saying, this could be you or this could be you. And I held up a vote by mail uh, mock uh, ballot to show them they could actually vote from home and avoid lines. So literally you can't be uh, creative enough and things like giving tours. I had the League of Women Voters come in recently and, and gave an overview of a vote by mail process and they absolutely loved it. Um, and as I'm talking, I'm thinking back to, there was a, a particular organization that wanted myself and, and a, a neighboring supervisor elections to come speak. And in the, we spoke nothing about uh, except for voting by mail. And there were some of the audience that were, you know, I started off by asking how many of you are, are hesitant or leery to vote by mail? About half the hands went up. And we got done kind of a, a really kind of a techie, geeky uh, procedural overview. By the time we got done, we had, we had four or five people uh, lined up to come see us to request a vote by mail ballot. So the point is, if you educate and keep it simple and be creative, it can be a successful endeavor. Thank you. Um, so uh, a bit of a, a catch-all for anything that you know we might have missed. Uh, what other communications considerations should election offices take into account when transitioning to or in increasing their usage of vote by mail? Amber, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, I think I think a couple of things. I mean, a lot of the things that we've talked about today are really important. Um, but I think that creating a, a a communication culture, if you will, that arms not only your. It's always easy to sort of say or assign the communication staff with dealing with communication. But really, I think it's important to look at every staff member as a conduit for communication. Everyone who answers the phone. Um, in the hotline should have certain for certain um, talking points and and be able to have and be armed with information that's important for the folks they're talking to all the way through even to the ballot security teams that are emptying the ballot drop boxes out in the field um, the election judges like you have to you have to train everyone really on all aspects of the communication piece because they are your representatives in out in the in the field and they need to understand and know what their role is and how that fits into the, the grand scheme of things. Um, I also think one thing that we didn't talk about today is the importance of communication with with partners. So um, the post office, for instance, is a, a, we could do a whole webinar on how to communicate with the post office and all of the things there. But that is a critical a critical. Um, partner in this process and, and having an open line of communication with them is really important. I think also, uh, in addition to the tours that Brian mentioned, opening tours for the public, for special groups, all of that is really, really important, but also bringing in your local elected officials, your, your Senate and congressional uh, contingents. I always invited, we had what we called a candidate tour, so we would invite everyone that was on the ballot to come in in advance of the election, see the process, show them exactly what to expect, explain what they would see in terms of results posting and, and what this process looks like. And, and that really, again, I think opens up the lines of communication across the spectrum. So it's not just about press, it's not just about Twitter accounts and Facebook and all that. It's, it's an entire communication strategy that you have to kick off now. And, and, um, and it's important to have everyone on the team sort of you know, swimming in the same direction on, on all things communication. Thank you. And I'll take this chance or that mention of the post office to plug video two that if you're watching this video three should be up. Uh, but video two, we spoke with representative from the post office and, and encourage you to watch that as well if you're not going in direct order. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about any other considerations? Yeah, you know, the question where it says, uh, in the question where it says, or increasing the usage of open mail, it's, it's, it's going to happen. You know, what I tell political parties and candidates, um, you have to have the hook because, you know, we, in Florida, there's been such an increase in utilization of vote by mail, but oftentimes candidates have a hard time convincing a voter who maybe signed up for it uh, during a presidential election and is getting one for a municipal or, or, or a local primary getting them to return that ballot. And I call it the hook, 
convincing that voter why it's important to get that ballot back. Obviously, everyone on this on this uh, video conference, we all get the importance of it. And I can tell you this, we have three city elections coming up. Um, and we sent a postcard out and referenced the coronavirus and social distancing and, and recommended voting by mail. These are small cities. And um, we the once the postcards hit, the utilization has, has been, or the request for vote by mail ballots, well, on average, we're averaging 10 or 15 a day. Now we're average important to consider. So it's not a matter of if, it's when the increase for requests are coming. And having that communication culture is huge. The USPS delivery timelines are a little bit of a concern to some voters. Having a relationship with your local USPS liaison and, and having that, that communication is just paramount. And so, um, you know, I think all, all, all things equal, I think it's definitely gonna be, in, you know, not a matter of if, but when the utilization uh, increased, increases rather than the request and being ready for it, obviously, and that's what we're talking about today. Thank you for that, Brian. And certainly that's a good reminder that, uh, you know, as, as most people know, but if, if, you're a, if you're a postmark state or a received by election day state, that's certainly an important piece to convey to voters in your communication and help them know when to get it back in the mail if they're mailing their ballot in. Um, do you wanna close us out on this one? Yeah, I wanna just come back to the voter for a minute because um, we've been talking a lot about the mechanics of transitioning to vote by mail, but there's one other aspect here, which is that one of the things that I hear from a lot of people, uh, even if they're showing up at a polling place to drop off their, their vote at home ballot, is that they like that sort of civic place, coming to the polling place as a, as a, civic, as a civic experience. And I think we're gonna have to think hard about how to transform that experience into one that still works for remote. Uh, we've been thinking up ideas like, what if, what if instead of or in addition to a vote by mail sticker, which we know people love in their vote by mail ballot, what if you had a placard, like a, a letter sized placard that could go in their window that said, I voted, have you, right? Or uh, I can imagine something like a neighborhood group getting together and saying, we're all gonna you know, meet on the front porch of our buildings and one by one, we're gonna go to the mailbox and, and, and post, and post our, 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 our ballots at the same time. Um, but things that, that recreate that civic market square and recreate that personal connection that people get from the polling place, even though uh, we're all voting from home individually. Um, so uh, at this time, we're basically wrapped up, and I know- still get, still get that sense of being in public. I know that um, as with many of these things, there's something that folks think about, and they're like, oh, I should have said this. So. <laughs> Closing comments time, that this is your opportunity to do that. Uh, Brian, any final thoughts or remarks that you want to share? Well, no, again, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think we covered a lot of good ground, and I think, you know, we can always improve. Um, you know, one of the things that we do, and I think all of us do in, in our line of work, you, you are constantly assessing um, what can you do better. I think you can always improve in all facets of election administration, but certainly with communicating with voters, just you know, comes to mind is again, be creative, ask, you know, don't seek out, don't reinvent the wheel, reach out to experts like hypothetically Whitney and Amber, for example, and, and others who know their stuff and live and breathe this stuff. And don't be shy to ask, uh, don't fall over your first draft and, and just, we're again, failure is not an option, but we're gonna get through this. Thank you. Whitney? But you may be frozen. Amber, you want to give us any final thoughts or comments? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having having us, Ben. And I think this is a, a key uh, part of the conversation and how we can prepare is, is, you know, leveraging communication tools and resources. And again, I think keeping the voter front and center in all of our thinking around that in terms of how we can um, improve their voting experience, but also improve their trust and confidence in the process. Um, I'm a huge proponent of transparency when it comes to communication and making sure that that voters are armed with good information about what this looks like, but also as we've as we've talked about all of the partners and the stakeholders and and it, you know it is a community event and um, it takes extraordinary creativity to make sure the community as a whole knows what's happening and can trust and have confidence in the process. Thank you. And Whitney. 
Well, I also want to thank you. I think these are, I've watched the, the first video that's up. I think these are wonderful conversations and I'm honored to have been invited to be part of it. Um, I, I think the thing that I think as I've looked at all the conversations that are going on around the country is just how capable and how creative and how um, professional election offices are. And uh, if you're sitting alone in a county thinking I have no one to help me and I have a four person staff, you actually have 8,000 colleagues across the country who can help you. Um, and lots of nonprofits like the Center for Civic Design, but like all of the others, League of Women Voters, all the other many places we've mentioned who are also on your team. So if you think of the team, think of elections as a big extended community team, I think we can all do it and we can vote. Absolutely. And uh, I don't think I have anything wiser than that to add at all. Thank you all for joining us. I uh, really appreciated the conversation. And uh, like I said, uh, happy to share any resources that you want to point us to. Uh, and uh, again, just thank you for being here today and helping us out with this. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben.